you dream of a classroom where learning is natural? Can we inspire students to lifelong learning? What exactly is the purpose of an education? Inspiring students to be curious, independent, creative, innovative, deep thinking, confident, proactive, collaborative, determined, educated. Rise to the challenge of changing the world. This is teaching. This is learning. This is who we are. Welcome to the Tabletop Inventing Podcast. How can a teenager from a good, decent, wonderful family end up making a mess out of their life by the age of 15? What is the path from poor teenage choices to a life of purpose and meaning? Where can parents look for some hope if their teen has taken a very bad path? Listen in for the hope-filled answers in today's podcast. Hey there, Innovation Nation. I got to talk to one of the most amazing individuals on today's podcast. If you like underdog transformation stories, then today's episode is tailor-made for you. And I think you'll agree with Norman Vincent Peale, who said, people become really quite remarkable when they start thinking they can do things. When they believe in themselves, they have the first secret of success. Confidence, or believing in yourself as the quote says, radically shifts what is possible. Belief, for or against our own ability, can have dramatic effects on what we believe to be possible. As individuals and even as a society, we often believe something to be impossible, such as running a four-minute mile. No documented cases of a mile being run faster than four minutes had occurred until an English runner named Roger Bannister broke that barrier on May 6, 1954. For thousands of years, we have run and competed in running games. Yet for some reason, in the years just following Roger Bannister's record-breaking run, many athletes began to run a four-minute mile. And now, it is common for a professional male middle-distance runner to be able to run a four-minute mile. Why the sudden change? Truthfully, we don't know exactly what causes achievement. But we do know that limiting beliefs can have a significant effect. For this reason, we work very hard to remove limiting beliefs as students tackle challenges in our Inventors Boot Camp every summer. Students are encouraged to try new things and notice the outcomes, because trying a new activity often leads us to new thinking. In fact, it turns out that the secret sauce for Roger Bannister seemed to have quite a bit to do with a new type of training that he began around that time. He noted significant changes in his running times after some of his training adjustments and continued in that direction. This approach of varying the inputs and observing the outputs is just the practical application of the scientific method, which is in high regard during Inventor's Boot Camp. If you'd like to find out more about Inventor's Boot Camp, visit inventingzone.com. Today, I get the privilege of introducing you to one of the most remarkable individuals ever to be in our podcast, John Griffith. John's is truly a story of tragedy and triumph. I won't spoil the plot, so join me as we go on a journey through innocence and tragedy to great hope. So my guest today is John Griffith. John engages youth in the outdoors and specifically in the conservation movement. And he's working to bring diversity into this movement. Uh, A little bit ago, he wrote a book called Totem Magic Going Mad. It's an eco-fantasy designed to hook kids into eco-conservation. So, John, tell us a little bit about how you got into this. Well, you know, I think it would start back with my grandmother if we were going to, like, really find the beginning of it. And she was – my grandmother's magical. And I've always believed that. And it started when I was, like, three or four years old. She lived in a mobile home park in the middle of the city. And in her backyard, in the middle of this, like, industrial area, in the middle of her backyard, she had planted this amazing garden. And it was a garden with soul, so there was, like, bees and butterflies there, and she had a little pond, and it was just in this very small backyard. And I remember her taking me when I was very, very young, like, holding her hand and having a big head and, like, worried about falling down young. 
and she told me that she could summon toads. And I, I remember not even really comprehending what a toad was. And so she started, like, calling her toads, and we walked around her yard, and she would flip over things, and there would be toad there. And I would pick it up, and it would pee on my hands, and I had the whole experience, and I thought, Grandma had magical powers, and I have been hooked on exploring nature ever since. And I discovered and have never forgotten, even though now I live up in the middle of the redwoods, that you can have nature in your backyard, in your very small urban backyard. You can have nature. That's where I fell in love with conservation was in my grandmother's backyard. That actually reminds me of my, my grandpa. My grandpa had a green thumb, and they always had a garden. And I've never been able to reproduce what he did. <laughs> <laughs> Neither have I. <laughs> Neither have but, I. Uh, how did you go from being interested at a very young age in your grandma's garden to where you are now? Is that, was that a straight path there, or were there other twists and turns? Well, you know, I, I was one of those kids who lived on the edge of suburbia, and so I saw suburbia swallow the oak woodlands and the riparian areas, the, the water areas, and I remember pulling stakes, construction stakes, out of the ground. I've heard some other conservationists that they did the same thing when they were kids. Like, I thought that would slow it because I knew what lived there, and I knew what putting houses on top of that would mean. And I was very concerned. And one day some older boys were shooting some birds. They are shooting some birds, and they are aiming their guns towards the roof, and they knew that I was, you know, 11 years old. They knew I was a good climber. They had me go on top of the roof and throw down birds. And when I got up there, there were several dead birds, mostly pigeons, and one of them was injured. And I remember feeling... I mean, I was raised by hunters, and there's a lot of hunting culture in my family, but no one killed just to kill. And I remember feeling rage, and I, and I came down with the bird, and I wasn't going to give it to him. And I went home, and my mom took me to this wildlife care center. And the woman, the director, Jan White, was so moved by my compassion for this bird that she let me volunteer there, even though I was way too young. And I volunteered there for four years, and that's where I learned that there's something we can do to help wildlife. There's something we can do to help conservation. And so after I, I had like a rough teenage time where I got involved with some pretty bad stuff and, and ended up running away from home, but I still had this conservation ethic even in this like angry teenage year. So when I turned 18, I joined the California Conservation Corps and I became a firefighter and I built trails and we planted trees. And from there, I became interested in college and ended up getting a degree in plant science and being active in the conservation movement ever since. How diversity ties into that is that where I grew up was a very multiracial area. And when I started getting involved in the conservation movement, I realized that a lot of the people in these, like Audubon and Sierra Club and California Native Plant Society, a lot of these people were white with gray hair. And I thought, wow, and they're, they're advocates for plants and animals, but it's almost like these plants and animals have an expiration date because all their guardians are really old and white and the country is diversifying and where is the diversity in these groups? And so I started to become interested in diversifying the conservation movement. And I thought that I was alone in that, but I have since made several connections and found out there's actually a lot of groups working on this, including um, a group called the Center for Diversity in the Environment. So we've joined together and we're pushing this conversation and Next week, I'm going to the Summit on Diversity in Yosemite with John Muir's great-great-grandson and Teresa Baker from the African-American National Park event, and we're going to continue to find solutions to diversify the conservation movement. Wow. So you have really gotten deep into this, and this seems to have had deep roots in, you know, as you were uh, growing up, particularly with Grandma and this experience you described early on. Mm -hmm. A little bit about what happened in the middle and how you kind of came back to this. Um, you mean like as far as in the middle and what, which middle? Oh, <laughs> teenage middle. Well, you, you said, yeah, the teenage middle where you said you kind of went off and did some bad stuff and you kind of came back. Because we're interested here on the podcast in kind of looking deep into, you know, what really happens in people's lives and what really brings them back. Because we want to find those hooks, in, you know, for teenagers to really become interested in their learning. And I'm curious, you know, how you navigated this and what brought you back. Well, I was a very, very bad teenager. I got involved in drugs really early. I got introduced to drugs really early and had a full-on drug problem by the time I was 15 years old and ended up running away from home first time when I was 15. And then my father was a cop, so this 
made it especially awkward. And my mom was a teacher's aide. So they were completely shocked that I had become this really bad teacher and, and running away from home and scared the crap out of them. And I was, I had my problem was with meth. So really bad things happened around that. I ended up dropping out of high school and I had some friends that passed away with circumstances around methamphetamines. And I started to wake up that this was, a, that I had made a really, really poor choice. And I knew that I wasn't going to be able to stay in my neighborhood, in my hometown. And my parents were done with me. I had stole from them. I had disappointed them over and over again. And so I heard about the California Conservation Corps through a friend. And I had that early interest in conservation. I really wanted to connect with nature. I kind of felt like that was the one thing that was pure and honest in my life was my interest in nature. So I joined the California Conservation Corps. And when I got there, the supervisors were, were on to me instantly. And they're like, okay, you can be here, but you need to go to NA. You need to go to Narcotics Anonymous. And you need to get drug tested. And because of their vigilance and their understanding and their compassion, I was done with methamphetamines when I was 18 years old when I joined the California Conservation Corps, and I've never gone back. And I learned the reason, what was so attractive about the California Conservation Corps in all core programs, what's, what's attractive about them is that they are purposeful, they are meaningful. So I couldn't have just gone to work at Denny's and earned some money and everything would have been okay. I was way too wild for that. I needed something meaningful. I needed to be a firefighter. I needed to build trails. I needed to help fill the earth. And so doing that was super empowering for me. And as my parents saw me after they believed that I'd really stopped doing drugs and after they saw that I was a firefighter, and then I got my GED in the, in the core program. Core programs help people get their GEDs that they had dropped out of school or their diplomas. Like, now we have diplomas. So that's what it was. It was meaningful, purposeful work, work that counted, healing things, fixing things, helping people. I can remember one of the first emergencies I went on was we were looking for a downed plane, and the family was there, and I saw how stressed out they were, how much in despair they were, and then I was trying to help them, and that made me feel really good. And so as I continued responding to emergencies like fires and stuff, I felt like I was part of the solution, and it was a feeling that I wasn't willing to let go of. I wanted to be part of the solution. I have dedicated my life to being a solutionary since then. I think that for a lot of teenagers who were like myself, made wrong choices and were pretty much your support structure gives up on you, being able to get into something like that where your life takes on meaning, where it becomes purposeful and it makes it easier for you to forgive yourself, and it definitely makes it easier for your family to forgive you. I'm very close to my parents now. I have been for decades since the California Conservation Corps. I guess I should just wrap this part of the story up is that after I went to college and I was a seasonal, I was a firefighter and I did wildlife surveys and I worked on fishing boats. 13 years after I left the California Conservation Corps as a youth, I came back and now I'm a supervisor for the California Conservation Corps. So I came back because I still want to be engaged with meaningful, purposeful work and I want to help heal our communities and heal the environment and I want to help youth transform in a non-judgmental way so that they also can go through the kind of experience that I went through, this transformational experience. So I guess I'm not as familiar with the CCC. So you finished high school while you were there, like you went back to high school. How does that work exactly? So the California Conservation Corps is a state youth workforce development program, and we have a charter school, John Muir Charter School, which is on our campuses. We have residential campuses. So youth can come live with us, and they work all day with us, and then at night they go to high school in our charter school. So you can – get your diploma and graduate. You can also take college classes and get all kinds of training. And there's California Conservation Corps is one of like 130 core programs in the United States. So said that now you're living up in the Redwoods. <laughs> That's near maybe uh, Porterville or uh, further north? I'm in Humboldt County. So I'm oh, uh, Arcata, the so, far northern coastal California. You said you were a firefighter for a while. Was that like for Forest Service? Yeah, I was a firefighter for the Forest Service and did fishery surveys for them. Um, I was a seasonal for like 11 years as I was going to college. I was just doing spring semesters because I had really fun, adventurous seasonal jobs, you know, fighting fires and doing fish surveys and doing bird surveys. And so I took my time with college. And then once I graduated, I decided to go back to the California Conservation Corps as a supervisor. 
So what was it that prompted you to come back to California Conservation Corps? Well, I had thought about it. Like, the CCC was a lifesaver for me because of how much it helped me get off drugs and get a GED and get my connection back with my family. And so it always had the sacred place in my, my mind. I was in graduate school at HSU, and I was really worried about the amount of loans I was taking out. And then my advising professor got into an argument with the school and ended up leaving. And so I was, like, kind of lost. And I was feeling lost. And at that time, there was a temporary opening in the CCC, and they invited me to apply for it. I applied for it and ended up getting it. And I thought about just doing it temporarily, but I fell so in love with it. It's, it's a magical job where you're helping a lot of times – youth from distressed communities, but not always, but probably half or more of our youth are from distressed communities. And so we're often working on projects where we're healing something. So we're doing salmon habitat restoration and helping an endangered fish, or we're doing coastal dunes restoration, so we're helping endangered plants. So we're healing the environment while we're also healing youth. And so it's a very powerful, awesome job that has some amazing rewards, you know, involved with it. So once I got in as a supervisor, I decided that that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And so I'm still here 13 years later. So tell us a couple of stories of things, of interactions or particular youth that came through the program that uh, just stick out in your mind as, you know, uh, opportunity, you know, unlocked kind of experiences. You know, there's, there's millions of them. I think offhand, So did you see I was in a viral video with a couple of my core members? I'm not sure if you're aware of that. I looked a couple of the videos up, and we'll probably link those up in the show notes because I think think they're awesome in the first place, but I I think it would be good for our our listeners to go check that out. But, yes, I saw a couple of them. So most of them are core videos. One of them went viral, and there's like five and a half million hits on it. And the two core members in that that video, one of them I'm still really close with because he ended up settling in this area. And there's a lot of core members that are like – him, his name's Antoine, he came to our program from a distressed community and from a single-parent household and wasn't sure what he was going to do. And where he was growing up, there was a lot of pressure to be in a gang, pressure to do drugs, not a big support network. So he stayed in the CCC and and he became a very good worker and got used to being outdoors. And he had grown up in urban Oakland and so he hadn't spent a lot of time outdoors. So we had to work through, you know, well, work is probably the wrong word. I got to be there for the first time of a lot of his nature discoveries. And so he, like, had never had close contact with snakes and bears and things like that. So that was that was fun, and that's always fun <laughs> to be there, you know, to be there for the first time discovery. Because a lot of the urban core members, like, they've never seen a snake in real life. They've never seen a bear in real life. And so, like, I love being there for those discoveries. Not just so much the scary ones as much as just I'm, like, bringing a salamander to me and saying, what kind of lizard is this? I'm like, that's not a lizard, that's an amphibian. Look at it, how is it different? And we start, I start asking them questions about it. They really, really look. And I love that. I love being there for people's first-time discoveries in nature. And Antoine became quite the outdoorsman over the course of two years in the CCC, building trails and doing salmon habitat restoration and, and fighting fires. And now he is a Forest Service firefighter and settled up here, him and his girlfriend, And, you know, there's a lot of stories like that where core members like myself, like I was, coming up someplace where there's not opportunities and learning some job skills and then having more options about, you know, are you going to go back into community and take some of these things you've learned, this environmental ethic you've learned, these job skills you've learned and go back and improve your community, which is great when they do that, or is it better for you to relocate and adopt a new community? And when you join the CTC, our goal is to move you at least 300 miles away from your hometown. And so a lot of the core members, it's their first time like out of their county, some of them. And I think that's one of the benefits of our program is the default of geography is just getting them out of their communities long enough to let their authentic selves develop. And then so after their year or two years, they spend in the CCC, because that's generally how long they stay in, three years max. And that's very few of them get to stay for three years. And when they leave, they leave with up to $8,000 in scholarships for one year. And they can go back to their community and go to college, or they can stay up here with us. And I think that that's, that's what's different about the core programs from other jobs that a youth might be engaged in, is that we help them travel and get out of their communities and see if they want to go back. There does seem to be a correlation between having the experience of being away from home far enough to realize that the world might be different than you think. Yeah. It was really good for me to get out of my community and never go back. 
but sometimes it's awesome when they do go back because a lot of them go back with this environmental ethic and they take that back to a very urban place and help to create, you know, organic community gardens and volunteer to help daylight streams or plant trees. And so either way, we don't want it to be a terminal experience where they come and participate in conservation projects for a year and then that just goes away. We'd like to create civic ecology stewards, stewards who are interested in fixing broken places, be it in their own communities or communities they adopted. So tell us a story, if you can think of one, about one of these kids who came to the CCC from what you call a distressed community and then learned some really valuable things, kind of had a metamorphosis, and then went back to their community and some of the things that they did when they went back. There's many such stories, but I think the one that stands out is a kid named Ben who came to us from Long Beach and was deeply involved in gangs, so much so that when he got his insurance, because we provide insurance, like he got a bullet removed out of his leg, he really wanted to start his life over, and it was extremely difficult. He was one of the core members of the Center program for a very long time. He didn't open up to me for a year, so I didn't know how deeply involved he was with gangs and what his life was like because it took a, a long time for him and I to build rapport. And a year is a long time in the CCC because we're, like, around each other all the time. We go out for eight days at a time camping at remote project sites. And so I get to know these youth really, really well in a very short amount of time. But he, it took him a year before he trusted me. And when he started opening up to me and the stories he told me, it, they were extremely sad. And he basically spent most of his childhood growing up in a laundromat. His mom had post-traumatic st stress syndrome from being in Cambodia during the Pol Pot era. And so she was having a really hard time raising her kids in another country where she didn't speak the language. And so he was raised by some other adults who ran a laundromat. And then he was exposed to some really bad kids, and they got him involved in all kinds of stuff. So when he joined the CCC, he was definitely very quiet the first year. And then when I realized how wounded he was, and I just felt like I, I didn't understand what he had been through to figure him out like the whys. And so I decided that I would just introduce new behaviors. You know, I'm not a psychologist, but I can introduce new behaviors. And I realized that he had this very keen eye for picking out things in the blur of green. So a lot of people... They don't know any plants. They can't identify plants. So forests and what they drive by, it's just a blur of green. But he could differentiate leaf shapes and flower colors and if there was a bird there. And so I went with that. And so I'm a pretty good naturalist. And so we, I started teaching him plants and I started teaching him birds and stuff. And he learned really, really fast and ended up going into our backcountry program. And that's when the core members will go out for five and a half months into the backcountry where there's no electricity, no flushing toilets, and they stay out there at their crew and build trails the whole time. So he came back from that. He was even more interested in the outdoors and took up fishing, and, and I just saw him. He was starting to smile and feel empowered and helpful, and so I had him start training new core members, and he continued feeling more powerful and purposeful and meaningful. So he ended up working for state parks in this area for a while, and then he went back to Long Beach, where today he's doing some roofing, but he's also volunteering to do different kinds of civic ecology projects where he's taking youth out and building trails or planting trees just as a volunteer. And he can reach a group of youth that would be really difficult for me because, you know, I might not be culturally competent with that particular crowd. So it's really helpful to have leaders from within a community reach out to youth, and so he's become that. And there's a lot of core members who have done that in their communities. Wow, those are some powerful stories. And I don't want to dilute them, so I don't think we'll dive down that path much more. So we'll take our left turn here, and I'll, I'll ask our first of two questions that we usually end with. And I think you have an interesting take on this, because we normally ask this to people who are either techie or in business or in education. So I'm interested in your perspective on this. We're now in a digital age. I mean, there's, there's no way for us to go back or unsee or undo what we've done. You know, we have cell phones and we have computers and the Internet and Wi-Fi, and, and there's some great things about this, but, you know, there may be some drawbacks as well. But putting all that aside, in that context with all of these new tools that we have and, you know, half a billion websites out there now, what does it mean to be, quote, educated in that environment? What does educated mean now? That's a beautiful question, and that was a great way to go to it. You know, it's interesting is I'm, I'm of the age where I can remember pre-Internet, and, so, and now I work with youth who have always known the Internet, have always known technology. And so I do a lot of comparisons just because it's interesting, especially 
if you read Richard Liu's book, Last Child in the Woods, he brings up hybrid minds. And he calls, or hybrid people, so what he calls hybrid people is having an education in nature. And I believe that we are nature, and there's no separation between humans and nature. But, so we'll say an education in natural settings and in wild settings and in habitats, and also having a education in technology. And that's what he calls a hybrid person. And he calls for us to be hybrid people, and I totally agree with that. I think that being an educated person, there's less need to memorize things like was taught to me when I was younger because now everybody has an encyclopedia Britannica in their front pocket instead of like, you know, shelves at their grandma's house or something. <laughs> so I think being educated now means being engaged and being aware and knowing what questions to ask because you can get an answer to most questions very easily. I can pull out my phone, and I do this at work all the time because we'll be working in areas and we'll come across a new plant or a new insect, and we won't know what it is. And I could say, okay, Google, and my phone will come on, and I can say iNaturalist. It'll bring up the iNaturalist app, and I could take a picture of it, and I could say, what is this? And it will GPS my location, and someone else will see what I found, and if they know what it is, they'll identify it for me. We can learn things very fast. Then I could put that into Google, and we could find out that, say, it was a moth. We could find out that moth pollinates a certain plant, and we can look around and see that plant is being pushed out by some invasive species that has invaded the area, and we're there to pull that invasive species. So we start to make connections to our work because of our technology, and so education is happening faster. And I think that taking that education out into nature and being outside with it, really bringing the technology with you on the hike and with you on the exploration is a wonderful thing to do. I think when we just keep it inside the house or inside of a building, I think that we're missing out on a really important aspect of education as an animal, and that is to be in our surroundings and to be in our environment. That is probably one of the most unique perspectives I've gotten on that, so thank you so much. That was excellent. <laughs> the, the last question we always like to ask is more of a philosophical question. And it is, what is the purpose of an education? You know, as you look back across your experience and as you look at the teens and young 20-somethings that come to you for one to three years, what is the purpose of an education for them, for, for you? So the purpose of education that we're trying to give them is to make them resilient. First and foremost, we're a workforce, a youth workforce development program. So we're trying to help them learn some job skills. We also would like them to go to college, so we provide a lot of scholarship money. There's a lot of opportunities to earn scholarships. We want them to learn how to think outside the box, be resilient, and to start understanding that there are some global issues that are going to affect them throughout their lives, like climate change and like species and extinctions and pollution of air and soil and water. So they need to be educated on that. But with this generation and just kind of like not having a crystal ball to see what's going to happen with the economy, we're trying to educate them that they should try to get a combination of hard skills and soft skills because they might need both. We try to teach them, you know, some agricultural background, some forest background, and we also encourage them to utilize their scholarships to get some technical background. So that's kind of where we come, the way we approach education is to try to become resilient and learn stuff that's going to benefit your community and you in soft skills and hard skills. Excellent. Well, I don't think we can end better than that. So I'm going to stop us right here, and I'm going to ask, okay. what's the best way for our audience to connect with you and with what you guys do? No matter where your listeners are, there is probably a CORE program. And the best way to learn about CORE programs, and if there's one near you, is to go to the CORE network, C-O-R-P-S, network.org, and you can find all kinds of CORE programs all over the United States. If they're interested in the California Conservation Corps, our website is www.ccc.ca.gov. And the best way to connect with me, my work, and my book, Total Magic Going Mad, I'm all over YouTube. So you can put John Griffith in YouTube, or you can put in Totem Magic Going Mad into YouTube, and you could find many videos, some dance videos, a lot of California Conservation Corps member videos, some I call it edutainment, so education and entertainment videos, and also on Facebook. If you put in John Griffith, you can find me on Facebook, or I have my book. My um, book, Total Magic Going Mad, has its own Facebook page. You can put in Total Magic Going Mad in Facebook and also find me. Excellent. Well, I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking some time to record this for our audience. Yeah, thanks for having me.
If you've been enjoying the conversations and insights here on the podcast, share it with a friend. Great ideas demand to be shared. You can also help fellow parents and educators by subscribing to the Tabletop Inventing podcast in iTunes, leaving a rating, and writing a review. If you use Android, subscribe, leave us a rating, and write a review in Stitcher. Links to subscribe can be found at www.ttinvent.com slash podcast. Contact us, and we'll think through the comments and answer your questions here in the podcast. And be sure to let us know if you'd like a shout-out or to remain anonymous. You can share your comments and questions at www.ttinvent.com slash podcast or by emailing us at podcast at ttinvent.com. Let's discuss your thoughts and questions. Join us again next time when we will again seek to answer the question, what is the purpose of an education? And as educators, how do we awaken the inventor in each of our students?